I started before I decided to record. All right. So anyway, we're doing inverse functions. Um, inverse relationship match the output values, which are y's, um, back to the original input values, which are x's. To find the inverse, you switch x and y, and then you solve for y. The domain and the range will switch. These are the things you must know about them, the inverses. The graph of the inverse is a reflection over the graph of a line y equals x. So the original function will flip over this line I'm about to show you cuts the first quadrant in half because 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, et cetera, would be on the line. And so with the values that are negative, so it would cut quadrant 3 in half as well. That's the line y equals x. So an ex um, we'll look at examples of this shortly. The inverse is a function if the original passes the horizontal line test. That's a new one. You guys are familiar with the vertical line test, which if a line does not pass through in a graph in more than one place, then that graph vertically, then that graph is a function. Now we're going to have a horizontal line test. So if you test a horizontal line on the original graph and it hits it in more than one place, then the graph's inverse is not going to be a function. Okay. The compositions of f of g of x and g of f of x will both give the result of x if, in fact, the equations are inverse functions. All right, let's do some examples so you can understand what this is. This particular set of points here is simply a relation. You would not connect the points. Okay, these are just points. To find the inverse of a set of points, you simply switch x and y, which is what those arrows are indicating. So the x's become the set of y values, so they'd be 4, 2, 0, negative 2, and negative 4. And the y values become um, of the inverse become the, are the x values of the original function, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. So you just switch x and y. Okay. Now here's an example and a picture. I'll show you where the line y equals x is. It's again cutting quadrant 1. I'm plotting the points 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5. So that's the line that cuts the two quadrants in half. This is the line y equals x. Notice that this line is reflected onto this line over that line, that line called y equals x. So remember how... Um, they're mere images of one another from geometry, okay? And these are equations of them, and this is an example of solving. We're going to start doing our own. You can look at this another time if you feel the need. Okay, so let's go ahead and give them a shot. So step one is to switch X and Y. The next step is to continue on and solve for Y. So I would need to add 4. and divide by 2. But I probably wouldn't leave it like this because I'd like to rewrite it in y equals form. So the last step is to set it up so it says y equals. And I don't want these it to be written like this. I'd rather see it, since I know this is linear, I'd rather see it as an equation that is in slope-intercept form. Okay, so that's a 1x, so this would be 1 half x plus I'm just separating the two pieces. 4 divided by 2 is 2. Okay, so that would look better as far as how to graph it. Okay? So we're going to put them in that form. So number 3, again, step 1 is to switch x and y. You don't have to keep writing this step, numbers. And then the next step is to solve for y. So I'm going to add subtract 6. Now, I have found that most of you, in general, I have found that most of your, my students have preferred to multiplying by the reciprocal, have preferred to multiply by the denominator first and then divide, okay? And I kind of realize that because the things I've seen on papers, so I'm, that's how I'm going to do it. If you'd like to multiply by the negative, the re not negative reciprocal, but the reciprocal, um, that's fine with me. I'm just going to go ahead and show multiply both sides by 3. That's going to be my first step. 
All right, so then I'm going to go ahead and distribute 3. I'm going to have 3x minus 18 equals negative 2y. Because the, y, the 3 is canceled out on the right. And now I would need to divide by negative 2. Okay, so if I'm going to take 3x minus 18 and divide both of them by negative 2, and you can do it separately like this, it probably maybe that would look better to you. So this is what I'm um, doing. To write it with negative 2 underneath is not wrong. It's just that I'd rather see it finally in the form that says y equals the fraction here in front of x or the slope will be negative 3 halves. So be negative 3 halves x. And then negative 18 divided by negative 2 would be positive plus 9. So now you would know the y-intercept is 9 and the slope is negative 3 halves. And then we get to number 4, which has a squared term in it. What is the shape of this graph? We should know immediately what this looks like. What's it called? Parabola. All right. So I'm going to just suggest to you that the, ver the um, vertex of this parabola, think about h would be 0 and k would be 8, and the a value is 2. So this would actually do something like that, right? Okay. Now I'm going to do the inverse. First step, I'm going to switch x and y. Second step, I'm going to start solving for y. So I'm going to have to subtract 8. And then I'm going to have to divide by 2, which would give me 1 half x minus 4 equals y squared. Well, what do I do now when I want to solve for y squared? And you get y alone. Take the square root. Okay, but whenever you have something squared, how many solutions should it have? All right, so we don't want to forget the plus or minus, okay? So let's go ahead and turn it around. y equals plus or minus the square root of 1 half x minus 4. There is no i. You are not, okay. It's not that you're taking the square root of negative 4 at all. I'll explain. This graph would be this parabola sideways, okay? So it would be reflected over this line. Okay, so it's going to go like this. Follow me? Okay, so the graph flips sideways. It's like a sideways parabola. So you see these plus or minus part? The plus part is for the top half. The minus part is for the bottom half. <clears throat> it's the only way for you to get your graphing calculator to graph that thing. Because remember, a square root function is simply one of those things, just a piece of it. So this one would be the other part of that. And... No, there is no I or imaginary part involved at all. So we're not separating these two. This would be um, a square root is a graph of something that is um, a curve. Okay? We didn't have any I stuff. That's only if we're taking the square root of a negative number by itself. Okay, so that's the answer to that question. And that is what it looks like. So here I pose you another question. Now do you understand the horizontal line test. So let's think about it. The horizontal line test tells me if the original graph, which is the first one I drew up there, does not pass a horizontal line test, which it doesn't, you could you would hit it twice in many, many places, then its inverse is not a function. This is not a function because it doesn't even pass the vertical line test. Okay? So you can tell by the original function that the inverse would not be a function by the horizontal line test. Are you with me? The horizontal line test tells you on the original function that the inverse won't be a function. Okay, moving on. All right, switch x and y. 2 fifths y minus 4 fifths. I'm thinking I'd like to get rid of those fractions. How about you? Clear them out? Sounds like a plan to me. I'm going to multiply every term by 5 little reminder of how to clear out fractions. 5 times x, we would bring down, 
equals, that'd be 2 times y minus 4. I just cleared out the fractions by multiplying 3 by 5. Now I'm going to add 4. 5x plus 4 is equal to 2y. And then I'm dividing by 2. I'll go ahead then and turn it around. So it says y equals 5 halves x plus 2. And that is the inverse. Okay, I believe you have to flip pages onto worksheet 10b. And we're at part two of inverse functions. Now this says the inverse is a function if the original graph passes the horizontal line test. Would the inverse of the function's graph be a function? Does this one pass the horizontal line test? Are you hitting it in more than one place if you draw a horizontal line? No. So this one does pass. That means its inverse would be a function. It passes the test, the H test. Number seven, does it pass a horizontal line test? No. <laughs> All right, so the inverse of it would not be a function. And number eight, does that pass a horizontal line test? Yes. And that's a yes, so its inverse would be a function. That was pretty quick. On to verifying inverses. Here's the fun part that I thought might be a little bit helpful even in your understanding of what's on the quiz tomorrow. We've had a little trouble with this idea of doing the f of g of x, which can be written f o g of x. It doesn't mean to multiply by x at all. Right? It just means to put the g function into the f function. If your f of g of x comes out to be x and the g of f of x simplifies down to x, then the two functions are inverses. Okay, They are inverses of one another. Now, I shouldn't have said functions. They don't have to be functions. We're going to verify that the following are inverses. Okay, so what we need to do is the f of g of x, which would mean put the g function into the f function. You are replacing the x in the f function. You are completely replacing the x. Do not keep it there. It's gone. You're going to put in its place the whole g function. So you're going to take the f function multiplies its input by 3. So you're going to be doing 3 times, and the input is all of this, 1 third x minus 2. And then the f function has 6 added on. All right, so I replaced the x with this whole thing. All right, now I need to start simplifying it. So if I distribute 3, 3 times a third is 1, so that's going to be x. 3 times minus 2 is minus 6, and then I've got that plus 6. Well, the 6s are opposites, so we are ending up with just x. And that's good. So far, these are inverses. The second step, we need to do the g of f of x which means we're going to put the f function into the g function. The g function takes a third of its input, so we're putting in for x in the g function, 3x plus 6. And then that g function subtracts 2. Okay, so I'm going to just start distributing. 1 third times 3 would be 1, so we've got x. One third of six is two. So I've got x plus two minus two, which simplifies to x. Since both the f of g of x and the g of f of x gave you x when simplified, that means the functions are inverses. Okay? So we have verified them as inverses.
Not all of them may be even inverses. Number 11, we're going to try it again. The f of g of x, which can be written f o g of x. This weird symbol right there means composite. Okay, so now we're going to put the g into the f. The f function starts off with a 4, then adds on, and it squares its input. So we're going to have to take the whole g function, square root of x minus 4, and we're going to have to put it in and square it. Mm -hmm. You need to show this, though. Okay, so you have to show all the steps. You can't just say, oh, this equals x. Okay, you have to verify it by showing the math. So we square that, and you do get 4 plus x minus 4, and the 4s cancel out, leaving you with just x. Yes? Do they always have equal just x? Yes. No, they must come down to just x, both of them. Otherwise, they are not inverses. So if we do the g of f of x, we'll see if we get an x. Okay, now I'm going to put the f function into the g. The g function takes the square root of its input. Um, the input is 4 plus x squared, and then subtract 4. The 4s cancel out, leaving us with the square root of x squared and the square root of x squared is x. So these have verified out to be inverse functions. Okay, number 12, are we ready? Does anybody need this page still? Okay, see if these are inverses. The f of g of x would be 2 times the g function, 5x minus 2, plus 3. I would distribute the 2 and get 10x minus 4 plus 3, and that simplifies to 10x minus 1. Uh-oh, didn't get an x. Looks like they're not going to be inverses. Let's see what we get for the g of f of x. Putting the f function into the g function would give us 5 times 2x plus 3 minus 2. Distributing gives you 10x plus 15 minus 2, which is 10x plus 13. So these are not inverses. Okay, I'm going to do one more. F of g of x. Let's see, put in the g function into the f. The f function cubes its input. Looks like these are going to be inverses. At least there's something about them that looks right. When you cube a cube root, you drop everything, this, at least the radical drops. So we get x minus 5 because they're inverse functions, inverse operations, I should say. And the 5s wipe out, and we end up with an x. Looking like inverse functions. The g of f of x. I'm going to put the f function into the g function, so i got to do the cube root of... Replace the x with x cubed plus 5, and then you've got minus 5 in there. Well, that gives me the cube root of x cubed, which is x. So these are inverse functions, because we got x when we did both composites. Do we want this for a minute still? You good, Erica? Yes? You okay? All right. All right. Graph each function using graphing calc to graph. What? Oh. All right. Graph each function using the graphing calc to graph and use the horizontal line to, des to determine the inverse, if the inverse is a function. We should know what this is right away. It's just a parabola, right? Okay. So, since this is a parabola, will the inverse be a function? No. This is a 
cubic. Now we would need to see this one. Is this? Yes. Okay. Um, we're going to have to see it because it's possible that it does this kind of twist. And if it does this kind of a loop, then it won't be, its inverse won't be a function because it won't pass the horizontal line test. Does it not do a loop? So does it just do this? Then the, then the inverse is a function. Okay, and then this one is a cubic that's going to do dipping. I, I'm almost certain it's going to do some strange stuff. So it should probably be doing something like this, which means it is not going to have an inverse that's a function. Brooke? Because this parabola won't pass the horizontal line test. So the inverse would go like that, and that's not a function. Okay? Nope, glad you asked if we weren't getting that. So see these, this one won't pass it. Yes. It died already? Okay. Yes. All right. Um, now they've stipulated here, find the inverse of the function f of x equals x squared for x being just positive. Why does this only work when x is greater than or equal to zero? Okay, so the point is, if that's a parabola normally, but you limit it to only the positive x values, then its graph would only be how much of a parabola? Yeah. Okay, so if you were, did the inverse now and you work it so that it's only going to have x being positive, then the equation would be able to have an inverse. Okay, so or this would have an inverse because this is only half of the parabola. Okay, so if you were to switch x and y, the x would be where, you know this is y, right? f of x is a y, right? If we switch x and y, it's going to be x equals y squared. Take the square root. You normally would have plus or minus, but we're not going to this time because we're only doing positive values. Okay, so the inverse is simply y equals the square root of x. And then why does this only work? Um, because if x is not restricted, it's a parabola. Okay, it would be a parabola with a domain equal to negative infinity to infinity. And that does not pass the horizontal line test. Okay, um, for right now, I'd like to go to the quiz preview and see what questions you may have. I'd like you to attempt the assignment, of course. You've got, gives you more time, like tomorrow and the next day, but tonight you want to make sure you're ready for the quiz. Now, I did send home a copy of the key, but I know there may be some questions you'd like me to do in detail. Okay, so let me just put it this way. Does anybody want anything from one through four that I erase and start over? You think you might have any difficulties with? Okay, nothing one, two? All right, three or four. You remember how to cube this. You're going to do a pair first and then go for the third one. Okay? And if you happen to have a four by four, you'll end up squaring two of them separately, and then you would have to do a triple distribution. And it'd be nine terms, and you'd have to simplify it. It'd be quite long.
since we did not do the Pascal's triangle at this time. All right, five and six and seven. Five. Okay. Probably order of operations might be getting you. If you're going to do the f of negative 3, that's putting in negative 3, of course, 4x. You'll have negative 4 times negative 3 plus 3 in the absolute value bars. You apply the negative 2 last. So you're going to be negative 2 times the absolute value. This is 12, positive 12 plus 3, which is 15. And then you'll take the absolute value 15 is 15, and negative 2 times 15 is negative 30. Yes? So no, you can't have the absolute value be negative. Absolute value is always. Wait, say it. No. The, the number inside the line is negative 15. Say the number is positive. No. Oh, this, this would be positive 15. You'd still get negative 30. Yep. The answer in the end would still be negative 30. Because the answer to the absolute value of negative 15 is positive 15. Correct. Okay? Scott? So for that one, who would apply the absolute value right after? No. 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 You cannot apply that at the negative oh. 2 until the end. It's negative 2 times 15. That is the last step. You cannot distribute within the absolute value bars. Logan. Okay. All right. The R of X is your revenue. Okay. Revenue means what you're selling the stuff for. So they're selling the T-shirts for $12.50. So the revenue function is $12.50X. R of X is $12.50X. Understand that part? Good. All right. The cost of the t-shirts was $60 for the design plus $450 for each shirt. So maybe they got some decals made up and then they had to, you know, they're getting them put on the shirts are $450, whatever they had to do. So they got $450 per shirt at $450X plus $60 in cost. That's your cost function. If you want to know your profit, we did a few of these. It's apparently that was in a book assignment as well. The profit function, P of X, is the revenue function minus the cost function. you got to take out your costs from your revenue. So if your revenue function is 1250X and you're subtracting from that 450X plus 60, that simplifies to the profit function, P of X, and I expect it's simplified. 1250X minus 450X would be 8X. And then don't forget to distribute the minus sign, minus 60. Okay, now you plug in uh, for 125 t-shirts and do 8 times 125 minus 60, and you should get $940, I think I remember. Okay. Yes, there will be one on the quiz. Okay, how about 8, 9, 10, 11? What about it? Um, I understand the total function. Well, what aren't you allowed to divide by? Can't divide by zero. So the denominator can never equal zero. We've talked about this several times. So you solve this now to find out what x can't be. By subtracting 7, so the 2x plus 7 cannot equal 0, which means 2x can't equal negative 7, and dividing by negative 2 would give you x cannot equal negative 7 halves. That is the restriction on the domain. Now, if, you want, if I asked you what is the domain then, it would be from negative infinity up to negative 7 halves. It would not include... The negative seven halves and it would be union with seven halves to infinity so it'd be everything else except that one number negative seven halves, so the, the seven halves sorry that right should be negative oh. sorry i forgot the negative sign okay other questions here all right
You should have the key in your school email. Okay. Um, I'll just circle the answers if they're not circled here. You tell me if you need more information. Okay. You, it says to do F minus G, so you should put it in F first and then plug it into G. It really doesn't matter when, but then the point is you have to subtract those, so it's 14 minus negative 6 is where I got 20. you got to do the P of negative 3 first, and then whatever you get, you have to put into the G function second. Is that what you needed, Gwen? You want me to go over 14? Put 8 into the P function. That's 24 minus 6, which is... So I'm doing the P of 8 times the Q of 8. So I'm going to put 8 into each function. So I show that here. I got 18 for the first one. Do you need me to do the math part there? Okay, so I plugged in 8. I got 24 minus 6, which is 18. The absolute value of 18 is 18. I plugged in 8 into the Q function. I had to do 2 times 8 squared minus 3. That's 2 times 64 because you have to do exponents before you do multiplication. That's 128 minus 3, which is 125. And then I did 18 times 125. Multiplied them after I found out what they were individually. You can't really composite, you know, multiply those two things because of the absolute value. Anything about 14? Okay. What's it mean to do? When you see the open hole thing, just take and put parentheses around here. I hope you guys did your book assignments. The practice was there. Put negative 3 into the P function. Okay, so I'm going to do the P of negative 3 first. That would be the absolute value of 3 times negative 3 minus 6. That's negative 9 minus 6, which is negative 15. The absolute value of negative 15 is 15. Now that I have evaluated the P of negative 3, I now have to do the Q of 15. Okay, so I found out what that is. Now I put 15 into the Q function. The Q function would take and square its input and then multiply it by 2, then subtract 3. So 15 squared is 225. 225 times 2 is 450. 450 minus 3 is 447. Okay. Continuing, 15, what happened here? Yeah, there we go. All right, in this section, uh, the final answers. Make sure I circled them. So anything here you want me to start from scratch? 15. You just apply the exponent of 5 to every term. So it's negative 2 to the 5th, x to the negative 15th, y to the 5th, z to the 10th. Anything with the next negative exponent cannot stay negative, and any number to a power needs to get evaluated. So negative 2 to the 5th is negative 32. The y to the 5th stays where it is, the z to the 10th stays where it is, and the x has to go to the basement because he wants to be positive. Goes down, reciprocates, is a reciprocal, however you want to say it. Something else here. Scott? Both of them? Okay. Very similar. No, no. It's cool. We All I did was flip this over to change it to a positive 2 exponent. Okay, and I did the same thing 
on the last one. Hold on one second. All right, so if you have a negative exponent to make the exponent positive, I just thought it would be better to flip right away because otherwise you're going to have 5 to the negative 2. I mean, it's not wrong. 5 to the negative 2, you could have a to the positive 4 over b to the negative 2. So say you didn't flip it, you can do that. I apply the rule of apply this outside power, power of a power rule, to each term inside. Then you have to say, well, I can't have negative exponents. a to the fourth is a positive exponent, so it'll stay on top. b to the second will have to come up to be positive, and 5 to the negative 2 has to go down. And then you have to evaluate the 5 to the second, which is 25. So you can do it like that if you like. Sure, I would definitely do this one that way because otherwise everything's going to have a negative exponent right off the bat, you know. So I would flip this over. I would change the negative 4 to a positive 4 because I did the reciprocal. Now I would apply the power of the power rule. So m to the 3rd to the 4th would be m to the 12th, 3 to the 4th, p to the 8th, and then I would evaluate. 3 to the 4th is 81, so I'd have 81p to the 8th on the bottom. That's why we practiced those exponent rules a while ago. Could have done some more practice on them, but I didn't. A little bit. What else? 19. You guys graph these things so much less unit. I'm hoping that you got that really quickly graphed. Understanding the end behavior now? That graph is pointing down on the left and down on the right. No one wants anything to talk about on 19 then? Okay, I will go on. 20? Okay. Um, This? Yeah. I just got some points. You can get them off the table. No, no. Yes. You can get these off the table so you can graph the twist. So just go put it in the graphing calculator. Go get some nice points off the table. I just I did them in my head. I mean, I just plugged in some numbers so I could see what was going on here. See, this one would not have an inverse that's a function because it has that twist. But they weren't asking that. Okay, so um, it was odd. Are we okay with the end behavior stuff on it? Pointing down on the left, pointing up on the right. Domain, negative infinity, infinity, range, negative infinity, infinity. Okay. I mean, I definitely go ahead and just put it in the graphing calculator on the table. All right, how about this stuff? I mean, this is old. Review, you're still supposed to know how to do this. Those of you who didn't get those right on the last two or three assessments, um, you better figure it out. It's on the final, and it's on this next quiz. Okay. Okay. You looked at the graph on the graphing calculator. So the graph, um, it's even. You'd see on the graphing calculator that it did this or something like that. And then you'd say it has how many times it hits the x axis, correct? Don't forget you do have the key um, available in your mail. Good luck. See you tomorrow.